we are here to talk to you about PyTorch and how it's a great tool for you to scale your deep learning models in a cheap and a fast and efficient way. So when we're scaling neural networks up, what that means is we are adding more and more layers to a neural network. And what this does is it allows your model to capture more nuance in your data. It allows your model to perform more complex tasks, but all of this doesn't come for free. Your model will start to require more memory and more compute. Um, let's see the Llama model, for example. It has four variants, ranging from 7 billion parameters to 70 billion parameters. The smallest variant, 7 billion, was trained using 2 trillion tokens, and it required around roughly 200,000 GPU hours. Well, that's a long time. So PyTorch, along with offering the modular building blocks to build your neural networks, it also offers some utilities to distribute this training workload. And let's take a look at one of them. Uh, called Distributed Data Parallel. So when you're training a model with DDP, there are three steps that need to happen. First, the forward pass, where you take the data and you pass it through the model, computes the loss, which is then backpropagated through the model, which then gives you the gradients. The third step, where we uh, update the model's weights, is preceded by a synchronization where all the computed gradients from each of these replicas are communicated with each other. Now the hallmark of DDP and really all distributed training is an overlap of the computation and communication. Essentially, what that means is simultaneously, we are doing the back propagation while communicating all of the calculated gradients. This saves us time and keeps the GPU running at a um, near 100% utilization. At a very high level, what that looks like, uh, you first divide the model into buckets. Each replica calculates the gradients of the first bucket. And while it is calculating the gradients of the second bucket, these first bucket gradients are synchronized. And this is happening simultaneously with the computation of the gradients in the second bucket. And similarly, as each bucket is being calculated, the preceding bucket's gradients are being communicated. This ensures that all the GPUs are running at full utilization and you're not having any idle workers. They're all working very hard to train your model. And this is the case where the model fits in one GPU. For example, the 7 billion model can fit on, um, on any cloud GPUs today. But when you start scaling that up, like for example, 70 billion or even the 30 billion models, it's very difficult to fit them in one GPU. So in that paradigm, in those regimes, the DDP model does not work. Now I'll call upon Raghu to talk to us about what in PyTorch allows us to train models which are larger than what your single GPU can accommodate. All right, so you have heard all about distributed data parallel and how do you scale a small model on very large number of GPUs and reduce your training times. So now let's look at what happens when we have a model that does not fit in a single GPU. And that is where FSDP comes to your rescue. FSDP stands for fully sharded data parallel. And what fully sharded data parallel does is it takes the model, breaks it down into what are called as units. And all of these units are then sharded across GPU. So you can take that, think of it as shredding the model and then each GPU owns small portions of this model. So that's where your shards are coming in. Now, what happens after that is pretty much, very much like what DDP is doing. Think of, instead of a model, you're thinking of it as a unit. And during the initial unit construction from the shards, 
you are going to do on all gather. And this happens in the forward pass. So you're gathering the unit, you're computing on top of it. And this happens across all the units. So as soon as your unit is computed, you lose that unit's memory and then you go to the next unit and so on. And that's a forward pass. Once the entire forward pass is computed, your loss is computed and you go, so this is your forward pass and now you're going to do an all gather in the backward pass. And during the backward pass, what is happening is you are computing again very much like here, you're gathering the units, you're computing the back propagation, but just in the in the reverse fashion. Once you have computed the gradients, then those are again very much like what you have done for your DDP. Those are synchronized across all the GPUs that are responsible for holding that particular portion of the model. So once you are synchronized, that completes your entire step, and then you continue doing all of this. And in FSDP, very much like DDP, you are going to utilize overlap in a significant way. Because imagine in DDP, there was only one single synchronization step. In FSDP, I have more opportunities for doing overlap and keeping those GPUs continuously busy while you are doing your computation. And that is how you achieve scale of these models. So what are the typical ways in which people train these large models? Uh, most of the world knows about them as HPC systems, very large scale systems with very high speed interconnects, state of the art GPUs and servers and training these models. So what happens if I have a, not an HPC system where you know I have a good node? So let's say that instead of this uh, GPU, we call this the node. Typically, nodes have eight, maybe 16 GPUs in them. And many of these, in the typical HPC system has an HPC interconnect. Things like the interconnect, where people may have heard the term InfiniBand. So very high speed interconnects between nodes. And people may have heard the term Ethernet. Ethernet is far more common in, in many, uh, many environments, whether it is cloud or on-prem environments, whereas InfiniBand is less common. So there is a con misconception that these larger models will always need InfiniBand, even though that is true for some of the larger models and it is faster, but with Ethernet also, you can train these models in an efficient manner. And that is where IBM helped worked with the PyTorch community and introduced this concept of rate limiter. What rate limiter is doing is really balancing off the trade-off between the overlap in terms of communication and computation by managing the memory in the GPU better. And that is how you reduce the amount of communication per GPU computation time step and you're increasing the amount of compute uh, while you're keeping that communication constant. And that is how you can get away with training on Ethernet while achieving similar kinds of benefits as InfiniBand. So Raghu, we saw quite a few things about how PyTorch helps mm -hmm. scaling up your uh, deep learning workloads and your AI workloads. Yes. We saw FSTP, we saw the rate limiter API. Yeah. And they do a pretty good job Absolutely, and we also saw how interconnects play a role, how you know you scale up and, and so on, right? But what happens uh, inside a single node between that CPU and GPU? Tell me a little bit more about it. Yeah, um, you know, it's an interesting question you raise because there is some more efficiency gains that we can, uh, we can obtain. And let's take a look at, you know, what's, what's happening under the hood. So, the reason, one of the reasons why PyTorch is so popular is because of its programming paradigm called Eager Mode. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, Eager Mode allows developers to have a very Pythonic approach to their AI programs. Mm -hmm. It allows dynamism, like you know, you can do your if else blocks. You can have for loops mm -hmm. within that. It's very flexible. Yeah. And uh, we already spoke about CPU and GPUs. Yeah. Um, so 
I'm going to draw a small little schematic over here, which sort of illustrates what's happening in eager mode. Let's say this is your CPU queue. And this is your GPU queue. And a queue is essentially the order of instructions that each chip is launching. Mm -hmm. Now, taking a step back, your AI programs or your AI models are essentially a sequence of operations. Mm -hmm. Small AI models, small deep networks have lesser instructions comparatively and larger models have many more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So every line of code that I write in, in my Python program basically translates to going to the GPU. Is that essentially what's happening? Yes. Almost every line is an independent instruction that your CPU is deriving from the program. And so we can probably think of your model, the execution of your model as a sequence of instructions over here. Mm -hmm. And because you're using a hardware accelerator like a GPU, you're going to queue up those instructions onto the relevant operations specific to the backend that you're using. Okay. So let's say you have your CUDA operations here on an NVIDIA GPU. So this is kind of how Ego Mode works. This is the pro paradigm that allows you to iterate or interact with your program in a very, uh, you know, one-to-one -one way. Okay. So what is happening between, uh, you know, these times when what are, what, what happens there? Uh, that's, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. These empty spaces over here are actually times when the GPU is not working. These are idle. And you know, that's what we do not like about our GPUs because they're a very expensive resource. We don't like them to be idle. We want mm -hmm. them to be working all through. Like, mm -hmm. you want to maximize the utilization over there. And these get more and more as you scale the, the model size, right? Exactly. Like, as, you, as your models get larger, this queue starts getting much longer. Mm -hmm. And as the queue starts getting longer, the number of these idle spaces start increasing quite a lot. Yeah. And these essentially translate to a lot of costs, unnecessary costs. Mm -hmm. You're burning GPU hours without actually getting any bang for your buck. Okay, so how do we address this? So here we have an interesting trade-off. It poses a pretty interesting engineering challenge. We want that eager mode-like flexibility. Absolutely. It makes programming fun. Mm -hmm. But we also want that efficiency. Mm -hmm. So earlier last, last year, uh, at the PyTorch conference, we announced 2.0. So PyTorch 2.0 packs in a very interesting new paradigm. It's, a, it's essentially a new compiler uh, called Torch Dynamo. And this still allows you to program your PyTorch code as you always have. It's still got that flexibility, that interactivity. But what it does differently is instead of having separate instructions queued up like in eager mode, your program is essentially converted to a graph of operations. It's almost a static graph. Mm -hmm. So all of these instructions are sort of merged together mm -hmm. and they form like, let's say one, two, M. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you might have graph breaks, you know, you might want to come back to uh, ego mode paradigm. So So your entire program has been translated to two instructions over here instead okay. of many different instructions. Mm -hmm. And on the GPU, again, you're queuing up only two instructions instead of all of the N instructions over here. Yeah. And quite often, you won't even have this break. So your entire program, your entire model is just one block mm -hmm. of instructions, mm -hmm. which executes seamlessly on the GPU. That is pretty cool. And how do you actually achieve this from a programming standpoint? Like what does, a, what does say me as a developer, what do I need to do to get this? 
one line of code. That's wonderful. All of this goodness in one API called Torchshot Compile. So that's like super easy for me as a developer to adopt. So what kind of speed ups have you seen with say Torchshot Compile? Let's just talk about training. Uh, so Torchshot Compile primarily targets training workloads and uh, depending on the architecture and the model, it varies, but we have seen speed ups of at least 30 times. Wow. So that is an order of magnitude. Many orders of magnitudes. Okay. Of, uh, on just plain old ego mode. Okay, wonderful. And at IBM, what we have been doing is to really work with the community and to look at Torch Compile from an inference lens. So what is the beauty of Compile, I feel, is that it not only works for training and giving that kind of speed up, but it actually works for inferencing as well. The same kind of gaps that you're seeing, we see that for inferencing too. Are you saying the same fundamental principle applies at on the rest time? Event. It's not exclusive to just training. It's not exclusive to training. So I think Torchword Compile is the new paradigm that is going to change efficiency completely across both training and inferencing. So fantastic times for PyTorch. And for the users. Yes, I know. And what else are we doing to get PyTorch to be more um, uh, community-oriented, to grow the adoption of larger models? Yeah, I mean, it's it's no secret. Like, we are living right now in the age of language models, large language models, which are just awe-inspiring in um, what simple algorithms are able to do. Mm -hmm. Well, not so simple. But uh, you're probably familiar with Llama. It's yeah. a language model from Meta AI. Yeah. And uh, a lot of that code is open sourced, you know, the model itself, the way it's there available to the community in a very permissive license. Mm -hmm. Moreover, we also have a lot of scripts available on how you can be using these downstream. Okay. Uh, there is one GitHub repository that you should check out. Okay. Um, it's called Llama Recipes. Um, so it's under the Facebook research slash Llama Recipes on GitHub. Uh, we'll add a link to, to that in the video. And... Uh, You'll, you'll notice uh, quite interestingly that they also use FSDP over there. Okay. Especially for fine-tuning Llama, yeah. you know. Yeah. You want to adapt all of that knowledge in that model to a particular domain or to a particular topic of interest. Yeah. So you want to fine-tune it. Mm -hmm. And of course, like we already saw how uh, uh, challenging it works and everything, yeah. Yeah, and how FSDP helps resolve a lot of that with an mm -hmm. easy-to-use API. And you can see that in practice at the Llama Recipes repository. Wonderful. So I think everything is coming together with PyTorch and the models, the way we train them, tune them, and I'm sure, you know, very soon it'll be around inferencing too. So this is fantastic news for the PyTorch community. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to what the community comes up with and what they, how they start using this. And Absolutely. Probably herald like a, probably a new, uh, new step in this age. Absolutely. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Suraj. Thanks, Raghu. Thanks for watching and if you like the video, please click on like and subscribe to our channel. And if you want to learn more about PyTorch, about the concepts we spoke about in this video and even Llama, do check out the links below in the video description.